Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of Ecommerce Espresso. It's so good to see so many of you coming back for more. Um, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome to Ecommerce Espresso. It's the webinar that's shorter than your coffee break. Uh, to keep these episodes quick and insightful, we don't do a Q&A at the end, but if you've got any questions for us or our guests, you can just tweet at us at Loyalty Lion HQ with anything you've got a question about or for, and we'll get back to you uh, as soon as we can. Just make sure you use the hashtag Ecommerce Espresso. Espresso. So before we let our coffees get too cold, let's jump straight in. Uh, I'd love to introduce today's guest. It's Derek Haney, uh, the Chief E-Commerce Technologist at E-Commerce Tech. Derek, could you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and a little bit about E-Commerce Tech? Yeah, I um, had past experience in e-commerce and just saw this opportunity um, where working in e-commerce tech specifically, merchants weren't really taking the purchase decision very seriously and they would just go with whatever tool kind of came about and so that was one of the starting kind of ideologies uh, i guess one other starting ideology was that i also saw that tech tools actually do a pretty bad job sorry loyalty line you guys actually <laughs> do great job, but of, of explaining their secret sauce what the aha moment is it's like okay you're a loyalty tool where's the magic and then with loyalty line when i saw that checkout like how you can use a slider at check um, in the in the cart and checkout at that points so i was like that's magic right like show that to me first and so we created ecommercetech.io to connect store owners with the right tech tools and help them vet, understand the landscape a little bit easier, discover new tools, and, and really make sure that they're putting the tools into their business at the right time and with the right resources in place. And so that's, that's where we're at today. We've done about 50 video reviews of tech products Wow! with over 140 partners. And we have about 70 or 80 e-commerce stores that we talk to on a quarterly basis about their tech stack. Amazing. I mean, that's just so much insight. I mean, I truthfully, I couldn't wait to talk to you today. I was saying even just before we got in recording, but outside of even just recording this e-commerce express, I really wanted to pick your brain. So um, if you're ready, I'm ready to jump into the first question. So um, why do you think so many e-commerce stores are switching their strategies to focus on retention? Yeah, and it's a loaded question because uh, <laughs> I think that I, I think that good companies have been caring about retention for a while now. And so the, so you could reframe this as like, why were stores so crummy before? Why, why did merchants not care? And actually what's really interesting here is that there was a, region, a reason that a lot of merchants could get away with not caring about repeat purchases, retention and loyalty. And it had to do with the proliferation of first the internet and then e-commerce and then drop shipping. All of these things combined allowed people to hide behind the curtain and really just sell products, drop shipping off of Alibaba or whatever it is. And all they needed to do was make sure the cost of acquisition was lower, you know, lower than the lifetime value, plus cost of goods sold was lower than lifetime value, and boom, they're making money. That's not how the world is going to work as in any market dynamic as the as as the market uh, proliferates as more competitors into the space you have to come up with new and innovative ways to to stay on top of the industry and so that's what i think is ultimately driving the change is, is a market dynamic standpoint from high competitive nature and people that were able to get away with um finding quick wins and, and there's nothing wrong with what what was going on back then i just always wish that people cared about the customer and the brand a little bit more and always from the beginning because I think that's what makes a great business as opposed to just money, right? The difference between making money and making, yeah. making I don't know, a difference. <laughs> uh, and so now people are realizing that if they're going to compete, they need to be this more digitally native vertical brand. They need to be keeping the customer forever. And at the end of the day, Amazon is going to eat everybody's lunch if you don't do this. So, and that's who like you're going to be competing with at some point. So, um, so I think that's, that's why we need to care. We need the, we need a lifetime value you know, that has a comma in it. For, for a lot of e-commerce merchants, their lifetime value is maybe $150, $300, $700 even, but not over the $1,000 mark. When you, when you keep somebody for a long period of time, all of a sudden that lifetime value is through the roof. And then it's just, you can acquire customers at any cost and you'll profit. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's something that, I mean, we get asked all the time um, by our, our clients and our merchants, like, when's a good time to start the loyalty, start a loyalty program? And, you know, one of those things that always surprises us is like, surely you are already thinking about it. Surely, surely you're already thinking about that lifetime value. And it seems like such a no-brainer to us. Um, we're getting more and more customers asking that because 
as you said, they're starting to really think about, well, if I'm spending so much to acquire these customers, I've really got to hold on to them. I can't afford the churn. And the other side of it, which you mentioned, which is that consumers now expect to be nurtured, whether that's direct to customer or they know they're buying a resale product, anything like that. Their expectation is that they're going to have a follow-up after the sale, during the sale, they're going to be asked to refer, all those kinds of things. So it's almost a missed opportunity when you don't follow up with, with loyalty activities. Um, so you know, any of our retailers or, or prospective merchants out there thinking when's the right time to launch you know loyalty tactics retention tactics or a loyalty program if you don't launch now you're kind of missing an opportunity with all those those guest checkouts i agree and I, i'll add what one more thing because a lot of merchants um they see this as one of two things when it comes to reten loyalty tools as reten for retention so just to plug loyalty line a little bit for you <laughs> oh, um, we appreciate the, it. The, the first the first objection is going to be isn't this spammy or annoying or something like that. Like the people don't want to do this, right? And then my answer is, if you if you don't have something to say, like if if you don't stand for anything and your brand is boring and generic, and and you're just like review me now, and the product was basic and the experience was basic, then yeah, that's probably annoying. But if you're a great brand, you've built a great product, and they have a great experience, they're gonna want to stay in touch with you. They're gonna want to refer other people to you, and you need tools to empower that. So the first thing is getting, let's say, maybe the product side of product market fit done. And then once you have that, this is fuel on the fire, right? Um, yeah. And there was a second thing. Oh, um, no, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I mean, you brought up a really good point about, about tech tools and implementing those tech tools. It takes me to our next question, which is that how do merchants prioritize implementing those new tech tools? Yeah. And, and a, like a loyalty program is great to have from the beginning, but you're gonna have limited time and resources on it. And you're not even gonna know, so loyalty is a cost to your business. You could, you could call it a cost of retention, a cost of reacquisition, however you wanna look at it. And a tool provider can cost a bit of money too. too. So you have to figure out how those costs bake into your margins. So that's, that's one of the first maybe starting criteria into implementing a new tool is, will this impact my margins? In some cases you could, um, make the decision to go negative in your margins to implement something early that will actually, you know, develop in as, as you grow. And so it, it accelerates the growth on a revenue standpoint, but eats at the profit margin, right? And so we have a lot of different tools and types of tools, but most of them will have some form of an impact on margin and they will have an impact that because a lot of tools have fixed costs, that's a lot of these things scale. So like, just as a really simple example, email service providers, and I think loyalty tools as well, but email service providers will say up to 5,000 contacts, it's $15 a month. Then up to 10,000 contacts, it's $50 a month. This isn't a big cost, but if you have 5,001 contacts, you're paying $50 a month for just over just you that, know, little, that little thing. So you actually have, if you divide that by your 5,001 contacts, it's a slightly higher than if you had 9,999. And this happens when you, when you have maybe a tool stack of 10, 15 tools, this is gonna happen all the time. And you need to just understand the levers and, and, uh, and, and you know, price, price um, hikes or, or, or when you're gonna hit another tier of pricing. But that, that's just one thing. I think when we really wanna prioritize tools, the first thing is we want to start at what is the bottom of the AARRR funnel, which is retention and referral. Um, mm -hmm. And you could go really either way, but usually retention, then referral, because the better you retain somebody, the more likely they are to refer somebody. Then we also look at the activation stage, which is, uh, which is the experience from when they purchase the product to when they use it to the, for the first time, making sure that that first time experience is a five or six star experience. Then we have actually acquisition. And this is where everyone tends to focus on first. Of course, you need a new customer to come in uh, in order to retain them. Uh, and so you do have to put fuel on the fire. But assuming you've got sales, you've got some traction, some volume, you should pretty much immediately turn focus back to retention. Uh, a lot, all the books say, you know, 100 true fans or 1,000 true fans or what, you know, all those types of things. It, it'd be way better to have 100 people loyal to the brand that refer other people and have given you a review than 2,000 people that have bought from you and won't talk to you anymore. Like it would on it that it's, it would be way better for your business and damn the revenue. You can wait if you, cause if you have the hundred true fans, the 2000 will come and they will be a lot better 
and your business will be better refined for them. So some people maybe just rush towards revenue growth and stuff like that. So I'm not really answering the question. No, you um, no you're, there's heaps of insight there. I mean, it's, it's, it's always a temptation to go for immediate, like bring as many customers in as you can. But if, if, if you've got retention on your mind from that first purchase, then you know you can tr- you're going to be able to treat those customers or you're actually going to treat their attention and, you know, and their purchase with kind of the love and care that, that is also you know, so closely aligned to your brand's values. Yeah, absolutely. And so when we're, when we're looking at prioritizing, implementing new tools, I always am going to, you know, I ask the merchants every, every single time, okay, how, what's revenue? What's, you know, gross margin? What's lifetime value? What's the cost of acquiring a customer? Um, like, what's the product lineup look like? Are you differentiated? Um, should you be looking at implementing a subscription component to your business? Do you need to implement an upsell? You can kind of see some of these these components as you dive into a business and look at it holistically. Maybe you should focus on tools that improve uh, shipping and logistics. I, I just talked with a food company. We're trying to figure out how to uh, ship scones, you know, internationally at a reasonable yes, price. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's they're they're UK based and they're crushing it right now with oh, online scone delivery. But they're losing fifteen dollars. They pay fifteen dollars in shipping for an order of fifty five dollars. Wow, that's an insane problem. So I told them they need to look at the logistics of the you know the size of the box. And so honestly, they don't need. They might need a a shipping and logistics consultant. And then they need to restructure their product offering around a box that's the cheapest to, to ship. Uh, and, and so there's, there's weird things like that that happen. That, that's not even a tool, but maybe they're looking at a ship station or ship or, or uh, th- those other uh, tools to help reduce uh, cost of shipping. And, and yeah. so, so the problems tend to arise uh, in the business. And you obviously want to put out the fires with a tool a lot of the times and a tool combined with a resource implementing it. On the flip side, there are tools that you just don't know about that can impact your business quite a lot. And so there's another thing you have to do, which is kind of keep your eyes open on blog content, on social media and Slack groups, uh, and, and just like in, in the world in general, looking and discovering those new tools and opportunities. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I just want to come back to that, that original point that you had around it's, and, and the examples you gave are always about identifying the problem that, that has kind of the biggest impact opportunity. You know, there's not going to be, we look at these tech tools, there's not going to be any like silver bullet or magic bullet that's like, oh, you just put this one tech tool in and then suddenly you'll be making a huge amount of money. It's more about what is your biggest problem or what's the biggest opportunity right now that you can find a tech tool that can either make things easier for you or that can maybe um, take some of the burden and put it on somebody else's tech stack um, or immediately deliver a different kind of value to your customers. Um, you mentioned that, you know, you've got to look at the true costs of things. Um, how important is, is like uh, ownership of, of these kinds of tools and technologies within a business once you start implementing them? Yeah, exactly. So that, that's definitely the next point is, is resources, internal resources. So you, um, like an email service provider is a huge investment. As an example, HubSpot's one of my favorite. Clavio is great for e-commerce, but I, I like HubSpot in general, just in business, not necessarily for e-commerce. But if you buy HubSpot as a one-person company, like you're going to have a hard time implementing such a robust tool and all the features. It's just like in, in e-commerce, if you, you buy Clavio and then you want to add SMS and messenger marketing and push notifications, and now you're going on Snapchat and TikTok, <laughs> and you have like one marketer in your company you're going to spread yourself too thin. You're not going to be able to execute on everything well. And it is absolutely true that you, you're you better off. Uh, and omni-channel is definitely the, the way of the future. And you need to be everywhere. But you have to execute well. And you need to do the core things well before moving on. And you need to, you know, make sure that you have enough resources in order to, in, in order to move to the next tool, in order to move to the next step, in order to maybe graduate. Uh, in, into another tool. And so some people just rush in and buy them all at once. Uh, <laughs> and you do have to have a good, strong starting stack. And you have a lot of work to do to get maybe a starting store off the ground. Um, luckily, the maintenance is a little bit smaller. And then as you're a growing brand, you need to just determine, okay, we're going to launch uh, Messenger SMS, push notifications, and a weekly newsletter. I'm going to hire somebody to do that. Yes. Right? So <laughs> we can see the resource allocation uh you know and and clearly map out in in our mind who's the owner of this tool who's going to report on it who's going to validate that it's making its money's worth uh and and how is that tool impacting our profitability our margin um and and our our conversion rate right our 
key metrics because yeah. you should be able to see that in a lot of tools, at least on the MarTech side of tools, you would um, marketing technology side of tools, mm -hmm. you, you should be able to see that. And unfortunately, most people implement the tool and then they don't ever even check the reports. And there, that just means that the tool is probably underutilized or like, there's just, there's, there's a missing component to your business. If you're not, if you're not checking under the hood, uh, probably every month at least. Yeah, I agree. There's, it's, it's something that I know anecdotally and, and something we work with our merchants all the time on is that you've really got to take reporting or into account as you're picking a tech tool. And it can often be the thing that helps you prioritize because there's no point in launching something if you can't see immediately, or as you said, within that first month, the impact that it's having on your business or how specifically it's helping you solve the problem. Um, and I just wanted to mention on that ownership thing, you know, especially as you people as uh, as merchants and store owners start to implement more of these tools, ownership is so important because all of these different tech tools are also touch points with your with your market and with your customers as well. So ensuring that, that brand consistency uh, is is there all the time um, and that people are getting the most out of those touch points. So ensuring that they've got you know, clear owners, that brand consistency be, can be there and that your brand values are coming across in those tech tools and all those touch points is so important as well. So it feels like, um, choosing based on the problem you need, to, or prioritizing your tech tools based on uh, the biggest impact and the problem you've got, um, the, res the resources that you have able to allocate to it, not just like whether you have the funds available, but do you have the team and the bandwidth available to dedicate the time to make those tools work and being able to see the kind of impact they're having on you. So the reporting and, and the kind of analytics side of things as well. Is that, a, is that a good summary of how you prioritize? Yeah, absolutely. And you hinted at one thing on the cost side, which is the time to break even or recoup the costs of the investment. And Loyalty Line is a great um, example of this. Loyalty tools take a, a little bit longer to pay off than other tools because you're gonna see it in retention. So you don't even see it in the first purchase. And then getting people onboarded to a loyalty, loyalty program, setting up a loyalty program, setting up the pages, the customer portal, and, and all of the things and in, in, integrating it into your website, that might cost, you know, it, internal resource wise a few grand uh to get done and and they're just you know how, how long until we recoup those costs is the question and so setting a timeline for that i think is really important and just accepting like you know business is all about making investments so it's like all right we're gonna put 10 grand down here it's gonna make us 100 grand by the end of the year let's go you yeah. know like of course i want to make that i make that bet every single time if <laughs> I, you know as long as i've got the bankroll to, uh, to of course. No, and that's something that, you know, again, when you're looking at tech tools, look at the services and support that they provide as part of those contracts, because I know that's something we pride ourselves on at Loyalty Line is getting people launched, giving them the support they need to work through the features and get their programs live so they can really get to that return as fast as possible. And, you know, the best tech tools out there offer really great customer service, really great documentation so that you can get going and get that help when you need it right away so that hopefully some of that cost is kind of pushed back onto the service provider as well um, that goes back to the resources side actually mm. so um, when it cut like so imagine you are an e-commerce merchant and you hired a loyalty expert in that case you probably don't need as much success and support but let's say you're a CEO and you've got a small team and you're basically the head of loyalty at your company you're gonna have to implement this system yourself you don't know a lot about it then you need a tool that has robust support same goes for email marketing and SMS. You know, if you are the expert, you might be able to find a tool that doesn't, you don't need all that much support with, but if you uh, aren't the expert, then you probably want handholding. And at the end of the day, you definitely want some level of support because there's going to be some issue. Yeah. Uh, that comes up that you're going to, you're going to need somebody there for. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. And to get that competitive edge, you know, to make sure you're using the best features possible, find the best matchup but, for your market. Yeah. I, I, I will argue with you though. Every tool I talk to, I've done over 50 p demos that we have published on the site. Everybody says they have the best support. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one differentiator that no one can really prove. Uh, that being said, there was one company that actually they had a, um, they have live chat with like an under 60 second response time. Oh, 24 that's seconds. good. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, that's, no, that is really good. You can't good. argue with that, right? <laughs> All right. Well, funnily enough, speaking of live chat, I mean, I can't believe you just brought that up. It's like you've read these oh. notes beforehand. Um, <laughs> let's move on to the final question, uh, which is a bit of a two-parter. Uh, when should an e-commerce store start thinking about live chat? Uh, and what is the most common mistake you've seen stores make with live chat? Yeah, this is... Um, it's a tricky question. This is definitely something that will this that works pretty much across the board for all businesses. Even more powerful for retention-focused businesses um, because an early live chat conversation leads to higher retention rate. 
leads to higher acquisition rate and leads to higher average order value. All of the things we care about in our business, live chat improves them. And there, there's a causation and a correlation thing going on here, meaning that um, if they're, uh, these, the people that you talk to in live chat are people that have initiated a conversation. So they're obviously more eager buyers to begin with. So you should expect them to convert higher and retain longer and all that stuff. But we do see causation. The conversation itself does impact the conversion without live chat on a store. So when, when a store implements live chat appropriately, they, they could expect an up to a 15% increase in total revenue. Wow. Uh, so this is huge, right? Like yeah. just more money on the table. That being said, live chat requires human resources. Uh, you know, some, there can be some automation up front. We certainly want automation up front for self-serve, but we also want a human on the back to respond within 90 seconds to an inquiry. Um, why within 90 seconds? Because when people ask you a question, they want an answer now. If they have to leave the site or wait a day, all of the urgency that they had built inside of them to purchase from you is gone and you have to re get that. I mean, that's why you're running a Facebook ad is to get somebody to buy from you like now. And so you have to answer those questions now in order to keep the conversion going essentially. Of course, people convert later and all that stuff, but by and large, the sooner the better. Um, and, and so, so we can see the, the value there, but the cost on the business, right? Like how much, what's a cost per ticket going to be, or maybe a cost per sale. And then how is that going to impact margin? It could be that this costs you $1 per order, $1 per new customer. And so that's, that could, you know, it could even be up to maybe, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect it to be up to $5, but it could be, you know, up to $5 cost per new customer. If that's your entire, you know, gross margin, then you're in trouble, you know. So you have to work it into your business. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. That being said, it increases average order value and retention. So usually it pays for itself. Sure. It, it might not be apparent early in on when you implement this system. It might look like you're losing money. But if you do the math over a long period of time, you do a cohort analysis of it, you should see higher average order value, higher retention. It just depends on the business, the product lineup. Like, are we able to sell them more products or are they literally just buying one product? And of course, you know, if we have low retention today, it's tougher to crack this nut. If you have high retention today, this is going to improve it. So it's, it's, it's another fuel on the fire situation. The, yeah, so, so when to implement it, you should, I think everyone should be looking to do this as soon as possible, really early in a business, maybe at even $10,000 revenue a month uh, ish, mm -hmm. even as like a CEO having to do the live chat. The, that being said, uh, that ties into the biggest mistake. The absolute biggest mistake is adding live chat to your website and then having to go straight to email. So <laughs> we, we know from, I, I did, I, we did a mystery shopper survey of 500 top e-commerce brands of them 63 percent of them have live chat on their site of the 63 percent or of the 100 percent actually uh seven percent so that leaves 50 uh three four five six six percent something like that um <laughs> quick math 56% of companies use live chat to go to email so only seven percent of brands were using it to talk to a person that means that it's a basically a pop-up form, yeah. except it's giving a negative customer experience because I wanted to talk to somebody and now you've just collected my email and I have to wait for a response. Also, because you have a live chat installed in your site, you're incentivizing conversation. So tickets go up. The number of ticket inquiries are going up and now you have to respond to more tickets. So you just increase your customer service workload, decrease customer satisfaction. This is very bad. <laughs> it's, it's <the laughs> yeah, worst. That's, a, that's a horrible combination. Yeah, yeah. And that's, 56% of the top 500 e-commerce brands are doing that. So the, the, it's, it's prolific, right? Like it, cool. it is a problem. And um, it's funny how they just don't notice it. Uh, yeah. And so, and the other thing is that email responses from live chat we found had a longer response time than regular email inquiries. So, <laughs> and it's because there's more tickets. That's our yeah. theory, at least in theory on it. Um, and so, so don't install live chat on your site unless you're going to man it. And I, you, even if you can only man it for eight hours a day, make sure that you're peak eight hours. Um, or if you're more like an on demand, like I'm just going to install it, have it on my phone. If my phone rings, I'll try my best to respond. Like that's okay to begin with. At the end of the day, what you want is 24 seven coverage because your store is open 24 seven. And even in those off hours, you can absolutely increase conversion rate and really wow customers. It's 3 a.m. and I was able to talk to somebody live. That's amazing. Like that's so awesome. you can get a lot of value 
off of that, especially for higher volume stores, mid market, you know, once you're plus $1 million revenue, I really feel like you should be investing in a 24 seven live chat strategy. And you of course want some bot automation uh, to complement so that people can self serve as best as possible. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily need to be a replacement for every single type of inquiry. It doesn't need to be an excuse for not making your information clear or your help documentation clear or your product descriptions really clear and easy to understand. But as a trust signal of like, we're here, you can talk to someone, we can help you. It does so much for your brand proposition. Um, and yeah, no, I, I'm totally, I couldn't agree more that you know, as soon as you can get it on, as soon as you can start working with it and trying it, I mean, it's the same for a lot of tech stack um, implementation. If you can get started and, and start learning right away, you'll find the best way to implement it. And you know, I think that the, the problems that you laid out to avoid, uh, are, that's what's so surprising about them is they're pretty easy to avoid. You just have to just have to pay attention essentially to what you're doing and, the, and, and take your customer's viewpoint a little bit more often, if not all the time, just to see how you're appearing to them. Um, well, I mean, that was uh, I, a fully loaded response. Um, I think we're basically out of time. So uh, yeah, that is unfortunately everything we've got time for today. Um, I learned so much. Uh, I'm sure everybody else found it super useful as well. So thank you so much, Derek, for joining us today. Uh, as always, we'll have the on-demand recording available. So if you feel like you've missed anything or you couldn't stay for the whole thing, that's fine. We'll send you a link to the on-demand recording. Uh, one last thank you to Derek for being today's guest speaker. And if you've got any questions for him or for me or Loyalty Lion uh, at all, just tweet at Loyalty Lion HQ with the hashtag ecommerce espresso. We hope to see you online again soon.